Hi everyone, <clears throat> my name is Satya Prakash Surya Narayana, a lecturer from School of Optometry, Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences, UCSI University, Malaysia. Today, I will be talking on a public health topic, but before that, let me thank the IC Biomed Organizing Committee to give me an opportunity to talk on public health topic. I will be talking on retinal neurodegeneration changes in preclinical diabetic retinopathy, where we are going to look into what are the neurodegenerative changes that we can see in a diabetes patient who doesn't have diabetic retinopathy yet clinically. Now, let's move on to the next slide. The contents that we're going to look into today is on the introduction and prevalence of diabetes mellitus, diabetic retinopathy. Thereafter, we're going to look into the pathogenesis of diabetic retinopathy and how do we classify the diabetic retinopathy. And lastly, we're going to look into the retinal neurodegeneration changes that can be seen in preclinical diabetic retinopathy. Diabetes mellitus is a chronic metabolic disease characterized by elevated levels of blood glucose, which leads over time to a serious systemic damages. Diabetes has become an element global issue due to many factors such as aging, urbanization, and the increasing prevalence of obesity. Good control of diabetes will definitely prevent the progression of the various complications that arises from diabetes. And these complications can be diabetic retinopathy, diabetic nephropathy, diabetic neuropathy, cardiovascular diseases, infections, etc. If we look into this flowchart over here, um, we can see that how diabetes has been changing over the time. We can see that diabetes in Southeast Asia is expected to increase by two folds by the year 2025, in which in Malaysia, by the end of 2030, we will have at least 2.48 million people with diabetes every year. And we can see that non-stop progression of diabetes population almost every year. Now, let me give you a scenario of what is happening in Malaysia. The latest statistics in Malaysia has shown that at least one in five adults in Malaysia have diabetes. That means there is about 3.9 million people aged 18 years and above are having diabetes. And the picture on, on your right, it is showing how diabetes can affect your system. It may affect your heart, causing you to have heart attack, stroke, peripheral neuropathy, diabetic, neuropathy, diabetic nephropathy, diabetic food, and in terms of the eye, it can cause you to have glaucoma, cataract, diabetic retinopathy, and peripheral artery disease. Now, diabetic retinopathy is the commonest and earliest microvascular complication of diabetes and remains the leading cause of acquired vision loss worldwide. In Malaysia, the R, or what we call as diabetic retinopathy, is the common cause of visual loss among adults. And prevalence of diabetic retinopathy is closely linked to the duration of diabetes. As you can see in the diagram below, prevalence of retinopathy in those with the onset of diabetes after the age of 30 years is 29%. In those within five years of diagnosis is 78%. What we can see here is the longer the duration of diabetes you have, the more risky you are to develop diabetic retinopathy. And at the time of diagnosis of diabetes, less than 5% of the patients will have diabetic retinopathy, while this prevalence rise 40 to 50% after 10 years. And almost all the patients with type 1 diabetes and more than 60% of patients with type 2 diabetes have some degree of retinopathy after 20 years of the disease, as been reported by World Health Organization in 2005. What are the risk factors of developing diabetic retinopathy? The first, of course, is the duration of diabetes. Thereafter, 
high level of blood glucose, as well as high blood pressure. Smoking is also a risk factor of developing diabetic retinopathy. Thereafter, improper management of uh, body weight and fat in the blood, uh, or what we call that hypercholesterolemia. And thereafter, genetic is also linked to the risk factors. If you have a family who has uh, diabetes and diabetic retinopathy, then most likely you are prone to have diabetic retinopathy. Now, diabetic retinopathy is a microvasculopathy that causes two possible things, which are retinal capillary occlusion and retinal capillary leakage. This retinal capillary occlusion is caused by the thickening of the capillary basement membrane, which leading to abnormal proliferation of capillary endothelium. Thereafter, you're going to have increased platelet addition, increased blood viscosity, and defective fibrinolysis. This, in turn, will lead to microvascular leakage, which is eventually caused by impairment of the endothelial tight junctions, loss of parasites, weakening of capillary walls, and elevated levels of vascular endothelial growth factor. Here is a picture to show you how the blood vessels in diabetic retinopathy looks like when there is occlusion, and this will lead to leakage later on. When we look into a retina or when you look into an eye of a diabetic patient, his retina or what we call as fundus should be appearing very clear like this on the first picture. Whereas the second picture showing how the retina of a diabetic retinopathy patient looks like where we see a lot of bleeding occurs all around the retina due to the leakages of the blood vessels. Thereafter, we also see a lot of yellow colored dots which indicating fats have been coming out from the blood vessels. What are the symptoms of diabetic retinopathy? We need to remember that at the early stage, this disease is completely asymptomatic. And the symptoms only arises once the disease progresses to the severe stage. Symptoms like blurring vision, floaters, fluctuating vision, distorted vision, dark areas, the vision, poor night vision, impact color vision, or partial or total loss of vision can be symptoms of diabetic retinopathy. How does the disease progress? From the beginning, we may be called as preclinical diabetic retinopathy, where a diabetic patient does not have diabetic retinopathy. That means when we check into his eyes, his eyes are completely normal. Diabetes does not affect the eyes. That is what we call preclinical diabetic retinopathy. However, the moment we see any changes <clears throat> occurring in the retina, then we can classify it as mild non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, which then progresses to moderate, moderate non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, severe non-proliferative <clears throat> diabetic retinopathy, and lastly, <clears throat> it is going into the prolifer proliferative stage of the diabetic retinopathy. And this is the severe stage, what we call as advanced diabetic eye disease. Now, how do we classify the disease according to the stages? These are being classified based on the observ observation that we get during the dilated ophthalmoscopy. When there are no abnormalities detected on diabetic patients, we call them that they're having no apparent retinopathy, or we call them preclinical diabetic retinopathy. When we see microaneurysms, we call it mild NPDR. And all the findings have been listed in this table that we can see how do we classify diabetic retinopathy. This is a retina of a diabetic patient who does not have any clinical changes. That shows that diabetes has not affect the retina clinically, but somehow when we check the neurodegenerative changes, which we're going to discuss in a while, may be already affected. 
So clinically, we call this as a no retinopathy or no diabetic retinopathy, or we call it preclinical stage of the diabetic retinopathy. When we look into the retina, retina is composed of 10 layers where um, the damages in diabetes can happen most of the time in the middle layer of the retina. Microaneurysms, which is a sign of mild non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, which can be seen as a red dots on the posterior pole, especially on the peripheral area. And this is the first ophthalmoscopically detectable change in diabetic retinopathy. If this is not being controlled, this may progress to uh, um, uh, moderate and PDR. But let's look into what happens in the retinal hemorrhages. Thereafter, in mild NPDR, these microaneurysms can progress into dot hemorrhages, dark blot and round hemorrhages, as well as flame shaped hemorrhages. We may also get fat leaking from the blood vessels, which is known as hard exudates. These are actually yellowish, waxy looking patches with distinct margins, which is surrounding capillaries and microorganisms, microaneurysms in a succinate pattern. We may also get cotton wool spots which is due to the occlusion of retinal precapillary arterioles supplying the nerve fiber layer. And these are white fluffy lesions in the nerve fiber layer. And if this is not being controlled, this will lead to more severe condition where we begin to see intraretinal microvascular abnormalities as well as venous beating. If we look into our photo, or a retinal photo of a patient who's having moderate NPDR, we can see more changes. We are seeing um, exudates over here with some bleeding elsewhere. So in this photo, we can already see that the patient is having microaneurysms, mild intraretinal microvascular abnormalities, venous bleeding, and cotton wool spot, which access to categorize this patient as having moderate NPDR. Severe NPDR is just more severe compared to what we have looked earlier, where we have more than 20 intraretinal hemorrhages in each of four quadrants. There are venous bleeding, prominent intraretinal microvascular abnormalities, and no signs of proliferative retinopathy. This is an example of severe NPDR. And proliferative diabetic retinopathy is a stage where there is a new blood vessels growing in. This is known as ischemia-induced neovascularization, which may happen at the optic disc or elsewhere on the retina and may also happen on the iris, which then will lead to vitreous hemorrhage, preretinal hemorrhages, retinal fraction, tears, and retinal detachment. If it is not further controlled, all of these stages can cause a patient to have diabetic macular edema, which is the leading cause of legal blindness in diabetics. And eventually, we classify the diabetic macular edema as a clinically significant diabetic macular edema, which is characterized by the thickening of the retina at or within 500 micrometer of the center of the macula. Advanced diabetic eye disease will cause a patient to have a persistent vitreous hemorrhage, diabetic fractional retinal detachment, as well as neovascular glaucoma. Visual loss in many cases of diabetic retinopathy can be prevented by early detection of the condition through screening, which makes early treatment possible. However, the current, di current guidelines for diagnosis Staging and management of diabetic retinopathy are based on the identification of visible vascular changes, such as hemorrhages, blood vessel leakage, and neovascularization that we have just looked. Interestingly, we found that 
Before all this clinical signs happen on the retina, there is neurodegeneration of the retina, which happens, which then lead to microvascular changes in diabetic retinopathy. So we found that in the preclinical diabetic retinopathy stage, there are more neurodegeneration changes occurs that are not visible to our eyes unless we do a functional test. Recent evidence has shown that diabetes affects the entire neurovascular unit of the retina, not merely the microvasculature. This function of the neural retina may precede the characteristic of the vascular findings, as been outlined by Jotikov in 2017. Retinal functional impairment may occur early in the course of diabetes and in patients without any signs of diabetic retinopathy, suggesting a role for neuroretinal damage in the pathogenesis of diabetic retinopathy. The retinal neural degeneration due to diabetes brings about alteration in retinal ganglion cells and the inner retinal neurons, which in turn lead to various functional deficits and visual problems. Visual equity is a standard test of visual function that is commonly used in clinic to grade the severity of diabetic retinopathy apart from the clinical signs seen during the examination. However, several studies have revealed Retinal neurodegenerative changes occurs in diabetic patients with or without diabetic retinopathy before the signs are being picked up by visual activity testing and fundus examination. Therefore, visual function, electrophysiological and morphological changes of the retina are seems to be more sensitive for retinal neuropathy in early stages of DR. For this purpose, we are actually classifying the neurodegenerative changes into uh, visual function, electrophysiology, as well as retinal structure, where we can see a clear neurodegenerative changes. Now, some studies have found that visual function is affected in diabetic retinopathy, especially at the preclinical stage. Let's first move on into the color vision. Prevalence of impact color vision among diabetes subjects with no diabetic retinopathy is 39.5% as measured using the FM100 test. Most diabetic patients were found to have triton where we found them to have blue-yellow defects, which can be explained by higher susceptibility of short wavelength phones in the retina as measured by FM100 tube test and anomaloscope. All three color confusion axes which is known to be proton, deuteron, and triton, to be compromised, at least during the very early stage of the disease, which reflects the diffuse pattern of color vision loss. This study used Cambridge color test. Early color defect to the blue cone system occurs in patients with diabetes, as measured using spectral sensitivity test. Apart from that, when we talked about visual function, we also found that contrast sensitivity is affected in diabetes. Contrast sensitivity is explained by the threshold between the visible and invisible targets, which has also been noted to have obvious significance in diabetic retinopathy cases. Reduction of contrast sensitivity in diabetic patients with mild or even with no diabetic retinopathy could be due to the disturbance of neural functions in the retina and visual pathways. This is in consequence of overloading mechanism of aldose reductive pathway. Significant reduction of contrast sensitivity among the subjects with diabetes duration of more than five years, those who are insulin dependent, those with poor glycemic control, and those subjects with the older age groups were found to have affected contrast sensitivity. And this reduction of contrast sensitivity function as measured with the peri-eruption chart in subjects with pre-diabetes who were defined as diabetic suspects by the borderline level of HbA1c sugar level. Now, let's look into ocular electrophysiology, which can, uh, which takes measurement of electroretinography, ERG. ERG has been found to be affected in diabetes, where ERG measures the electrical activity of the retina in response to an intermittent flash stimulus. 
Generally, changes in the ERG parameters correlate strongly with diabetic retinopathy severity and the progression of the disease, which leads to increasing retinal ischemia and prolongs the implicit time and decreases the amplitude of ERG. Implicit times of photopic ERG B waves or 30 Hz flicker ERG were highly correlated with the severity of the diabetic retinopathy. Similarly, full field ERG has been shown to be a sensitive method for the detection of retinal impairment during the early stages of diabetes and follow up of the grading of diabetic retinopathy. Yamamoto et al. used flash ERG to study the responses of cones in 31 diabetic patients, in which 15 of them had no signs of retinopathy. Their results showed in diabetics with or without retinopathy, early involvement of type S cones sensitive to blue light, which appear to be more susceptible to hypoxic damage in diabetes. Interestingly, we also found that it is correlated with diabetic retinopathy severity. Both the rate and extent of pupillary constriction in response to light stimulus decrease with increasing of ER severity. Significant correlations between the severity of diabetic retinopathy and implicit times also suggest that the implicit times of flicker ERG can be an adjunctive tool to screen for diabetic retinopathy. The ERG and study of oscillatory potentials have definitely proved to be a valuable and objective tool for the early diagnosis of the disease and potentially for the ophthalmology follow-up to diabetic patients, as been found by Peso Solido and, uh, and et al. in 2015. Now, when we look into the retinal morphology or structural changes, we found that early diabetes will show changes in the retinal layer thickness. This can be studied using the spectral domain optical coherence tomography, in which we call SDOCT, in assessing the retinal nerve fiber layer changes that has been reported to define the retinal structure together with quantitative assessment of visual function in revealing retinal neurodegeneration in hyperbilic neuropathy. OCT will actually give a cross section of all 10 layers where we can eventually measure the thickness of the individual layer. What we have seen in diabetes is each individual layer thickness may be altered compared to the normal patient. Somebody who has diabetes will have the thickness changes compared to a healthy population. Evidence of early neurodegeneration can be shown in thinning retinal nerve fiber layer in diabetic patients with no diabetic retinopathy compared to health controls. Thinning of the retinal nerve fiber layer, as well as thinning of the ganglion cell layer and inner plexiform layer in diabetic patients with mild NPDR has been observed compared to no diabetic retinopathy. Interestingly, there is also significant reduction of ganglion cell, inner plexiform layer, and retinal nerve fiber layer thickness values in both no DR, mild, and PDR groups compared with healthy controls. This confirmed that neuroretinal alteration occur preceding to microvascular damages in diabetes. GCL plus IPL and outer plexiform layer thinning in mild NPDR has been also observed compared to the healthy controls. The next parameter that we are interested of is to study the retinal vessel caliber where we are looking into the diameter changes of the blood vessels. The latest advances in fundus photography techniques have allowed precise measurement of the subtle vascular characteristic of the retina, which also includes the measurement of retinal vessel diameter. In another word, we call this as caliber. This machine allows us to measure the diameter of the blood vessels surrounding the optic disc. In a cross-sectional study in patients of type 2 diabetes mellitus without diabetic retinopathy or with only early stage of NPDR, retinal arteriolar caliber was positively correlated with macular ganglion cell layer thickness and retinal venular caliber correlated negatively with the macular retinal thickness and positively with retinal nerve fiber layer thickness at the optic disc has been found by Fragger in et al. in 2016. 
wider retinal glandular diameters were associated with the presence of diabetic retinopathy and narrower atrial calibers were correlated with the severe diabetic retinopathy. Narrower retinal arterial caliber is associated with old age and high blood pressure and predicts the incidence of hypertension and diabetes, while wider venular caliber is associated with impact fasting glucose and diabetes, dyslipidemia and inflammation. So just to recall, we have seen the neurodegenerative changes that occurs in visual function, where we looked into color vision, contrast sensitivity. Thereafter, we move on to the retinal morphology, uh, where we looked into changes in the retinal layer thickness, retinal vessel caliber. And we also look into the electrophysiology status, changes in diabetes. Now, let's move on and see how all these three different tests, or rather all the tests that we have mentioned earlier are associated in preclinical diabetic retinopathy, which is telling us that these patients are having neurodegenerative changes. Liu et al, in an attempt to study the ERG association with the caliber of the retinal vessel of patients with a clinical signs of diabetic retinopathy, they have found that there is a reduction in the amplitude of the auxiliary potential and slow implicit time. Correlations have been found between color vision thresholds and both the time since diagnosis and HbA1c levels at the time of examination. This tells us that the longer the duration of the disease, it is associated with the greater chronic hyperglycemia and subsequently greater color vision defects. Strong correlations have been found where the longer the duration of diabetes, the more neurodegenerative changes can be seen by means of visual function measurements. The early detection of diabetic retinopathy at subclinical level could be helpful in reducing the impact on vision and lessen the need for the invasive treatments of diabetic retinopathy. The early detection involved in identifying the most suitable test that could become a biomarker in determining the neurodegenerative changes of diabetic retinopathy at the preclinical stage. In conclusion, this review highlights a variety of research protocols for early detection of diabetic retinopathy. Generally, all the studies indicated that the signs at an early stage of retinopathy may progress even without visible clinical signs of retinopathy. Therefore, because of the evidence of functional and structural damage occurs, the timely detection of diabetic retinopathy is necessary, where we have to detect the neurodegenerative changes. With that, I would like to thank you for listening to this short presentation. And I, I hope I've given an insightful information about neurodegenerative changes that can be seen in diabetic retinopathy. Once again, I would like to thank the organizing committee of IC Biomed to give me an opportunity. See you. Thank you.